Okay, we'll take our Bibles and we'll start in Psalm 107. We're just going to get a thought from there and then we're going to move around quite a bit. So you didn't get an outline to us. Probably pretty good. You would have been shocked if you had seen it. This way I can just work through whatever we get through. Amen? Psalm 107. The title of my message is simply this. Say something. Uh, not now. I mean, <laughs> I don't want you all shouting at me. But say something uh, as in, in, in light of the idea that we're supposed to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. You can't witness if you don't open your mouth. And I hope this will be a help, an encouragement, and a challenge to all of us, myself included. We'll begin in Psalm 107, begin in verse number 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And truly, this, Satan is our enemy, is he not? Did he not have control of our lives? Did he not dictate where we went, what we did, and we were enslaved to sin? Hopeless. Miserable. Oh, yeah, we could put on the show, but deep in our heart, we knew we had no peace. You could try to entertain it away, drink it away, you know, fill your life with pleasure, but that emptiness is still there until Christ came in. Verse 3, and he gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a solitary way. Isn't that describe of a lost person? Just wandering through the wilderness. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Here we're talking about the idea of the soul. It's not just physical hunger. It's talking about their soul being destitute. Hungry and thirsty for something. Trying this, trying that, it not being uh, filling the, the, the need, then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. That is a picture of salvation and what God gives to us when we get saved. I hope he did that for you. If he didn't, you aren't saved yet. But he, you can be saved if you're not saved. I hope you'll listen tonight. In fact, tonight we're going to be talking about how to help other people get saved. And maybe you're in here tonight and you're like, I don't know this idea of saved, lost, anything. I don't know. I don't know if I'm close to God or not close to God. Listen, because the message we're trying to deliver to people is what we all got ourselves first. And I hope it'll be a help to you too. But the, the, our, our text verse, where I want to focus in on is verse number two. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and how clear it is, how helpful it is, how instructive it is. And I ask, Lord, I, I need your help. I need your mercy as I present your word. This is a, a pretty big task, and I don't feel up to it. I need your help, and I pray you'd encourage us. Lord, we need your help also. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. One of the ways we can show our appreciation to the Lord is to tell other people about the same salvation that he's offered to us. It says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So I want to ask some questions tonight about uh, witnessing, about evangelism, and I want to give the answers to from the Scripture. Along the way, we're going to consider several stories. I, I think I have more stories than I have time to tell, so we'll just see how that goes. But I'm going to share some stories as a way to illustrate the points. Uh, some of them are personal. It's not because I think I'm the best soul winner in the world, because I don't think I am. Uh, I'm humbled that God has used me. So I'm not giving these as, you know, uh, saying, hey, look at me, I'm the best. No, I'm not. I'm hoping it, it'll be an encouragement that if God can use feeble me, he could use feeble you also. But then some, other, some of the other illustrations from other people. Um, some are success stories, and some are disappointments. And I Try to put a mix in there. I hope it'll be a help as we go along. So let's answer some questions. Ask it first. Number one, why? Why should we say something? Why should we say something to the lost? Uh, there's several reasons. I'll give you a few. First of all, it's a sign of salvation. The Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The word redeem means to buy back, to be purchased. If you've been purchased by Christ, if you are one of God's own, if you're saved, if you're born again, say so. That's what the scripture says. 
It's a sign of being saved is that we tell other people about the Lord. It, it's something that God expects us to do. It's, uh, if we have a testimony, we should share the testimony. I've heard of instances where people wondered, you know, why a friend or a relative never witnessed to them. J. Uh, Wilbur Chapman was a popular evangelist in the late 1800s and early 1900s. He told of um, how, uh, you know, we often, he put included himself, we often think that some people just aren't interested in salvation. And he recounted a story how he was haunted by his own lack of witnessing in his college days. His roommate was not a Christian. Uh, I don't know what college or university he went to, but he was, uh, he was there and he confessed um, uh, that he, he had never warned this guy that he knew was not saved, never warned him one time. At the end of school, his schooling, he had room with him for about two years, uh, the young man looked at him and said, why have you never asked me to be a Christian? And Chapman replied, well, I thought you didn't care. I thought you weren't interested in knowing about the Lord. The young man replied, the whole reason I wanted to be your roommate was so that you'd talk to me about the Lord. He said, there wasn't a night or a day that I wasn't willing to talk. Chapman was smitten. But by this time, by the time he actually got nerve up to talk to Chapman, his heart had grown cold. And as hard as Chapman tried to witness to him, the young man was no longer willing to listen. And to Chapman's um, shame, he said he, he, don't know, he doesn't know if he ever got saved. If we're born again, we should so say so. Believe it or not, and I've read other stories where people were waiting for a Christian to bring it up. But we think, oh no, they might not be interested. No, it's a sign of being saved. Let's just do what we're supposed to do. We can't determine how someone responds, but we can at least give them a chance to respond to the good news. They can't respond if they haven't heard. How shall they hear without a preacher? Now, a preacher isn't one who just gets up behind the pulpit. I know I am preaching, at least I'm trying, right? But the idea of preach means to proclaim, to present, to declare. All of us should be doing that. It's so simple that a brand new convert can do it. Remember the woman at the well? She, had, she was uh, reached by Jesus Christ. She was not told to go and witness, but she did just because that's what saved people do. The Bible says in, in uh, John 4, 28 through 30, the woman left her water pot and, w and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. She wasn't told to go witness. She just did it. She had an experience that the Lord saved her. The Lord revealed things to her. And she was so excited, she just had to go and tell some people. And her, she, what did she do? She didn't know a bunch about the Bible. She went and just did what she could do. And she got a whole bunch of people to come out and listen to Jesus. It's so simple. A brand new convert can do it. It's so simple. A young person can do it. I used, when we were on the mission field in Africa, serving in Zambia, it was fun to, to go out soul winning with my son. And my girls went out with my, with my wife. And it was fun to see my son just passing out tracts, inviting people to church. There are people who came to church. I, I remember one man in particular who came to church and got saved. In fact, I think a couple of men right now. There's a young man in Kabwe, and there's a a, a, a middle-aged guy in, in, in the town of Monsey came to church because John invited him and got saved. Anybody can do it. We just have to do it. It's a sign of our salvation. That's just something we do. If, if witnessing is a sign of salvation, then why don't save people witness? Well, let's consider the next reason then. So it's not only a sign of salvation, it's a sign of submission. At times, we don't want to witness just because we're stubborn. Do you always feel like doing what God wants you to do? I don't. To my shame, I don't always feel like doing what God wants. Don't look at me because you don't always feel like it either. Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and do what? 
Preach the gospel to every creature. That word ye is the plural form of the word you. In English, our English, we just say you. You could be you singular, you could be you plural. Then it was thee and thou, those are the you singulars. You and ye are you plural in the Bible. It, it actually does make a lot of sense. People say, I don't understand it. It makes a lot of sense. So when Jesus said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, he was talking to everybody in his audience. All those that heard him, he expected all of them to go out and proclaim the good news. It's a sign of submission that we all obey what the Lord Jesus Christ has told us to do. It's his will that we preach the gospel. It's not exclusively for pastors. I guess I said the word preach there refers to uh, proclaim, to publish. We're all supposed to proclaim what Christ has done. Now, let's kind of simplify the verse. I'm not changing the Bible, but just, just all Christians are to go and witness to all the lost. That's really what the Bible is getting at. All of us who are saved should go tell all the people who aren't saved how to get saved. Pretty simple, isn't it? And if we don't do that, what are we? We're disobedient, we're not submitted to the Lord. Should we be submitted? Yes. We always feel a whole lot better after we've obeyed the Lord, don't we? We feel shamed when we don't obey him. In the end, we do. We need to make sure we get engaged. Therefore, by winning souls, we show that we're in submission to Christ's command, and that's a pretty good reason to tell other people about the Lord. So, let the redeemed the Lord say so. Say something. Why? Because it's a sign of salvation, because it's a sign of submission. Thirdly, because it's a sign of the Spirit's filling. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. So the Holy Spirit comes upon a saved person, gives them power, and what? Power to do what? Power to witness. So ye shall be witnesses unto me. So the Lord was teaching that People who are filled with the Spirit would be able to and would witness for him. So what does it mean if we rarely witness for Christ? Can we actually say that we're consistently filled with the Holy Spirit? I think not. So when's the last time you witnessed to somebody? Or at least tried? Well, no, this is where the rubber meets the road. We wonder why we don't have this fulfilled, exciting Christian life because we're not doing what God told us to do. Right. Too often we're filled with self, not with the Holy Spirit. Now let's not forget one of the main uh, reasons that we have the Holy Spirit. It's not to feel good, it's to do what? It's to tell the old, old story. Also, we can be encouraged that uh, he'll empower us to do it, right? He'll give us the power to do it. We, we can ask God to fill us, and we'll receive that power to be able to speak to other people for the Lord. That's what the apostles did. Remember, they were threatened in the book of Acts, chapter number four. They were threatened. It says, you go and do this again. You go out and witness and tell people about Jesus again. You keep, your, you keep opening your mouth like that. He says, we're going to beat you. They were threatened and told not to to preach the gospel. And they knew they were supposed to do it, but they were a little bit afraid of the repercussions. Now, sometimes we have a little bit of fear, but our repercussions aren't the same, are they? We're probably not going to be taken by the magistrates and beaten and imprisoned. At least not yet. The country might get to that, but now it's just like someone might say, don't give me that, or they might slam a door in our face, or they might, you know, they might even cuss you out, but whoa, whoa. That's a little different than getting beat. So consider their prayer. In Acts 4, 29, it says, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak the word. They, what do they do? They, they got a problem. They said, we know we should preach. We know we should witness. It's not going to be real easy, so let's just ask God for boldness. So they pray. Two verses later, we see the result. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. I don't know how many times I have pleaded that verse 
to the Lord. Lord, I need boldness because I need your Holy Spirit's power so I can preach with boldness because I'm a little bit timid. I need your help. You may be timid also, but if you sincerely ask God to fill you with his spirit, do you think he will keep his word and do for you what he's done for others? And if we don't ask, then we're probably not going to get it. And we're probably not going to go out and witness. And people aren't going to get saved. God will give you what you need. So why should we tell others? Because it's a sign that the Spirit works in us. Another reason we should witness. Why? Because it's a sign of sensitivity. Uh, Being filled with the Spirit gives us the ability and the power to witness. But we also must be sensitive to his leading. So I want you to turn to the book of Acts, chapter number 8. See a couple verses in Acts, chapter number 8. So I want us to see that God expects us to witness. I'm giving you some reasons why. So Philip had just been involved with a pretty exciting revival in Samaria. And we see, we pick it up here in chapter 8, verse number 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go to the, toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting In his chariot read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? So get the picture. Here's this um, man from Ethiopia. He goes up to Jerusalem. He goes there intending to worship. He leaves still not knowing the true God. He got a portion of the scriptures, book of Isaiah, And he's riding back in his chariot, and God said, the angel, first of all, the angel comes and says, hey, you go speak to him. He says, arise, back in there, verse 26, he says, arise and go. I like verse 27, and he arose and went. He was sensitive to the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit said, go near, join thyself to him. And he went and, and, and drew near. When the Lord nudges us to witness We need to move as Philip did. We don't always, do we? Sometimes we get that nudge and we, eh, I remember one time I was, I was actually traveling, uh, this is just a couple years ago, uh, traveling in neighborhood Bible time. No, it wasn't a couple years. (laughs) And it was after a rally, flying into, um, flying into Colorado. And there was a, a young man, I was sitting next to a young man, and I was also a young man, I was probably uh, 24-ish or so, and he, you know, he, he just looked like a pretty worldly dude, you know, he's got the long hair, and he was just, I don't know if he had his, back then, the Walkman, you know, you know, jamming out or whatever, and I just like, I sized him up, like, you know, this guy's not interested in the Bible here, I'm in my suit, and you know. Not that I didn't want to talk to him, it was just, but I didn't, I guess. <laughs> I just figured, yeah, he's probably not interested. The Lord nudged me, and I judged that he probably wouldn't be interested in the gospel. And although the Lord had nudged, he nudged me again, then I'm like, well, you know what? I knew I probably should, but, you know, we're just about to land. It's probably not really time to try to witness to him. I'll just give him a tract when we get off, and maybe that'll be good. You know, I did something, you know. Um... So, then we get the announcement in the, from, over the intercom. This flight has been diverted to another airport. I'm like, what? And so I'm thinking, all right, Lord, I know why that was. I've been fighting you. I've been telling you, no, I don't have time, and now we're going to another airport. i got plenty of time. So I started witnessing the guy. By the time we landed, he had bowed his head, prayed, and asked the Lord to save him. And it was a wonderful, he was ready, he, he was interested. We shouldn't be just, you know, sizing people up. Who are we? Amen. I learned a lesson. We're nobody, I'm a nobody. Everybody needs the Lord. 
no matter what they look like, act like, or whatever. They need, we all need a Lord. What was I? Yeah, I wasn't much when the Lord found me either. I was, a, I was that long-haired guy too. How quickly we forget what we were, huh? Praise the Lord for his patience, his long-suffering. And so God's good to us. It's important that we listen to him. I'll have to be honest with you. Sometimes, you know, people don't always get saved when you follow the Lord's leading. They don't. I remember one time uh, a few years ago, we, my wife and I we were out canvassing and came across, you know, we were driving down one road and I saw a guy on the porch and the Lord prompted me to go and witness to him. I'm like, yeah, but that's, he's up on his porch. I, you know, I don't, you know, okay, I'll go. And I went. I walked up, started handing him a track, telling him who I was and what I was, what I was there to do. And he's like, mm, don't want any of that. I was like, I walked away. I was like, Lord, I thought you wanted me to go witness. I did, and look, it failed. He didn't even take the track. And it puzzled me for a long time. So why did he do it? I don't know. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. But you know what I, you know what I think happened? He was an older guy. I think God wanted to give him one more chance to hear the gospel. Amen. It's not up to me how people react. It's just up to me to do and be sensitive to what the Lord wants me to do. And sometimes I'm not sensitive, and sometimes you're not sensitive. And we need to ask God to forgive us for that and ask him to help us. I think in, in our heart of hearts, most of us who are saved do want to witness. Sometimes I have to remind the devil, no, I do love, you know that song, I love to tell the story? I do love to tell the story. I enjoy telling the story. So get out of here, devil. Stop telling me, putting doubts in my mind and all of that. You say, well, that's, that's a, you, you, you're a preacher. You're supposed to be going witnessing. How about the, uh, the busy mom who was in a park? She saw a 78-year-old man just sitting on the park bench all alone. He'd been living alone for quite a while. She felt that nudge from the Lord to go talk to him. She did. She witnessed. He prayed to receive Christ as his Savior. How about that busy mom in the park? It's not just guys who are in the ministry. It's every one of us. Amen? So it's a sign of sensitivity and it's also a sign of single-mindedness. Let me ask you, what's your main focus in life? Don't well, think about it. Okay? We have car salesmen here. What's their main focus? Sell lots of cars? No. Tell people about Christ. They sell cars so that they can put food on the table. We have policemen that come to our church. Is their primary calling in life to catch the bad guys? No, I'm happy they're catching bad guys. But their primary purpose in life is to tell people about Jesus Christ. We have people involved in personal finance, helping people make investments and preparing for their future and, and you know, helping them get life insurance and build those, you know, uh, IRAs, all that. Is their main focus to make lots of money for themselves or for their clients? Shouldn't be. Their main focus should be to win people for Jesus Christ. Whatever your occupation is, our main purpose is to glorify God. We're told in uh, Romans eleven thirty six, for of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. We are for God's glory. He created us for his glory. So what glorifies God? Well, good question. John 15, 8 answers that. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So talking to the lost, to the, to lost people about Jesus and seeing people saved glorifies God. That means it should be one of our top priorities in life. Is it? Are we looking for those opportunities? When we're out and about, are we seeing people as souls that they, hey, this person's going to die and go to heaven or hell? You can't control 
their, what they do with the gospel, but you control whether or not you give them the gospel. They're going to go to heaven or hell. There's a lot of people out there who are carrying some heavy hearts and some big burdens. They don't know what's going to happen in life. Just look at the world. It's a mess. It's been exciting. You know, the pandemic? The pandemic. Yeah, it's had a lot of negative influences on our, our, on our nature. But I'll tell you one, one good thing. Some people are more open and receptive to taking gospel tracts. I like that. I've handed out so many, hey, this is some good news. With all the bad news in the world, you know, whether it's one of your, you know, the, your life matters or, uh, hey, times are tough, look up, or something like that, and, you know, just put, trying to get them to look up to the Lord and say, hey, and there's some wonderful promises in here. And person after person say, wow, thank you. Yeah, I need that. We need to see the needs of others and try to witness to them. It ought to be the focus of our life. You know, in Luke chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus said a few words, but three words in particular that are striking. He said, I must preach. Now, the word again, preach, means to announce good news, to declare, to bring glad tidings. It simply means to share the gospel. He said, I must preach. Is there something in you that says, I must witness? I think if you're saved, most of us, there is something in there, isn't there? Sometimes we need to fan it a little bit and encourage it a little bit and be reminded what we need to do. You know, visiting, making discipleship lessons, all that's good. It's necessary. It's part of the Great Commission. Sometimes people don't do it. We need to do it. But then also, I'll tell you, this wintertime, wow, it's kind of hard to go out and canvas and knock on doors and find a lot of prospects when it's, you know, freezing and, 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 and the snow's falling. The, the op number of opportunities to go out and talk to people are limited. And then, then you find other people who are scared to death, you know, they're, they're still wearing, they're in the parking lot of Walmart and they still have two masks on. And they're afraid that something out there in the air is going to catch them. It's like, you you know, it's like, you know. So I just, the Lord just burdened me, you know, recently. He's like, you know, I just want to be able to talk to somebody. It was fun. Brother Hunt and I got to go out to the, he goes to the truck stop ministry, and, and I was, it was fun. I got to go out to the truck stop ministry. You know, you hear Marvin talking about, he's all excited. Brother Sam, Sam's happy because, uh, He's looking at China thinking, man, I can't witness openly, and I can do it here. Let me go do it. Amen? He's taking college guys out, and I don't know if he's making them go out or buying them ice cream or what. I don't know. <laughs> he's just excited to get out there, and what we need to do is just get out there, and it was fun. Just get out there and be able to talk to somebody, be able to pass out a bunch of tracks. You can look for opportunities to pass out tracks. I try to look for opportunities to pass out tracks. The weather's breaking. Isn't that great? We can get out there and canvas a little bit and do some more for the Lord. It's exciting. The point is, we must feel compelled to say something. I had an appointment with a cardiologist, one of those side effects of uh, COVID, right? And yeah, he made me go through it. No, I shouldn't made me. He suggested all these different tests and things like that, and thankfully, they all came back well. Uh, so the Lord put it on my heart to give him a particular track the last time we had met together and not just to give him a track but to say something along, along the way and you know how sometimes you're in the doctor's office they're in and they're out and he got done telling me what he wanted to do and I pulled out the track and I handed it to him and I said I started to explain something and he saw that there was something important and he, he stopped he went back down and sat down and looked very intent and wanted to listen. And of course, time was limited, so I couldn't, you know, like, you know, take, take forever and go, go through everything. But he saw that it was important, and he listened. My point is this. We think people aren't going to listen. They are willing to listen. 
And we just need to look for those opportunities to say something. Again, that's the whole point of the message. Say something. Does that mean someone's going to get saved every time you say something? No. But we got to say something. When I check into a hotel, I try to, you know, look for an opportunity to give a tract. Sometimes, you know, it's not real conducive to talk much right then. Maybe I'll circle back a little bit later and try another time or whatever. But if I have an opportunity, I remember my, my, when my mom passed away about a year and a half ago, I was able to give a young lady at the counter one of the Amazing Grace tracks. And she said, oh, I need that right now. I was like, oh, okay, I hope, you, hope, hope it helps you. No, it's not what, it's like, oh, you need that right now. What was that? That was an open door to say a lot more about the gospel. And I, I had a long time uninterrupted to present the plan of salvation to her. And then things got busy and time was crunched, and I had to quickly say, hey, this is what you can do, and this is how you can receive Christ. And I had to go on my way. The next day I saw her, and I asked her, so did you take care? She said, I went home, and I talked to my grandmother. She said, and I asked Christ to save me. She, all we had to do is look for opportunities, right? God will put a burning desire into our hearts to witness. Why, wow, we got the best news in the world. And if we're saved, we want to share it. Paul had a similar uh, attitude. He said, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You know, his whole verse was this, for though, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He had this burning desire. It was singleness of mind. He was focused. He had a purpose. He had a sense of urgency. We need to be there. We need to have that. We need to be looking for opportunities at the grocery store, at the gas pump, at the doctor's office, wherever we are. Years ago, I went to visit my grandfather in the hospital, and the man in the bed next to him was really struggling, struggling to breathe, 95 years old. And I realized he was probably in his last days, and I was burdened for his soul. I didn't know him from anybody. And so I found out his name. His name was Steve. and He was so weak and struggling to to, to breathe, it's not, he, there wasn't much that he could say at that point, but he, he could communicate through nodding yes and nodding no. And I went and just started talking to him and sharing the gospel. And I asked him when I got finished, I said, would you like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? I, I had gotten enough out of him to know which church he had gone to and things like that. But, and I asked him if you'd like to receive Christ as his Savior, and he nodded his head yes. He couldn't pray out loud, and so I just said, listen, I can lead in a prayer. If, if you mean this in your heart, you can pray and, and receive Christ as your Savior. And when we finished, I said, did you pray and ask Jesus to save you? He nodded his head, yes. Now, who put that burning desire in me to witness to this 95-year-old man taking his last breath? breath? It was God. But if it was all filled with me, like we often are, like I often am, I'm not thinking about that guy for nothing. All we need to do is respond to what the Lord wants us to do. And like Paul, can you say, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel? Paul's like, I've got to tell others. That needs to be the driving desire of our lives. Frankly, sometimes it's not. But it can be. And we can confess that and say, Lord, I know it should be, and I do like to tell people about you, and there's some reasons I struggle, but I'm asking, Lord, that you forgive me for that and help me with it and fill me with boldness, and will he do it? Yes! So why should we say something? I gave you several reasons. What should we say? Let me go through quickly. There's three basic things God wants us to present to sinners. First, we can pre present a powerful message. He says in Mark, uh, Mark 16, 50, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What's the gospel? It's good news. It literally means good news. 
We have good news to tell people. Why would we be afraid to tell them good news? Tell the good news. You don't have to start with, you know, you're a dirty, rotten sinner, you're going to die and go to hell. You can get to there, but you can start with, you know, God loves you. And he's got a plan for your life, and he, and he's, he wants the best for you. And there's something that separates us between those blessings from, uh, from us and God. And that's our sin. And then we can get into showing them lovingly and care, carefully how Christ died for us. Present the good news. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So we're presenting a powerful message. Why? Because it's, 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 the, it's the gospel. It's good news. And he's going to tell us what the gospel is. Most of you understand this, you know, but it's, it's good to look at it. It's good to present it to people. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 1, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. So what's the gospel? He's, I'm going to declare to you. I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. So we drop down and we see what it is. It's three things. First of all, we see Christ's sacrifice in verse number 3. And I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. You see, Jesus died for our sins. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We all deserve to die and be punished for our sin. Right? A murderer needs to be punished. We don't want the murderer out in the streets. We want the judge to do the right thing and, and uh, convict him. At least I do. But, you know, we've committed some spiritual crimes against God. We've sinned against him, and so we are also guilty. We're also condemned. And we have to show that Christ paid for that sin. He died for our sins. Not only we see Christ's sacrifice, we see Christ's sentence. What was that sentence? It was death. Verse 3, For I deliver unto you, first of all, that, which I also received, how that Christ died for us for our sins, according to the Scriptures. And verse number 4, And that he was buried. He was buried. You don't bury live people. Bury dead people. He died. Died for me. Died for you. Then we see Christ's satisfaction. You see, he rose from the dead in verse number five. I'm sorry, still there in verse number four. And he, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He paid. Why, why do you say satisfaction? Because he paid the debt that I couldn't pay. All right, so when a, when a prisoner, when, you know, a, a criminal is convicted, he stands before the judge, he's sentenced, he does his time. When his time's up and he's fulfilled the sentence, what, hap what happens? He's set free. He's paid for it. He's free. Christ paid for our sins. That's why God rose him from the dead. He's alive. He's free. And we can be free from our sins if we receive Christ as our Savior. He's a powerful Savior. He's alive. And he's waiting right now to intervene for sinners. But sinners need to know that he's waiting. So what are we going to present? A powerful message. Second, we present a per appointed message. Jesus said in, in Luke 24, 47, you say, well, what am I supposed to tell people? Yeah, the gospel. Secondly, he appointed message. He said, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations. The message of, of repentance is pointed enough. We don't have to be prickly in our presentation. You don't have to go, yeah, you know, you, you know where you deserve to go. No, we all deserve to go there. Show them that they need to change their mind about sin. And that happens when we show what the penalty for sin is. See, repentance is nothing more than a change of mind, and it's evidenced by a desire for a changed life. It's not, you know, repentance is not someone changing their life in order to be saved. That's work salvation. That Bible teaches against that. No, God says that we can't be saved by our works. Repentance is more than just wanting to change or trying to change. It involves turning to Jesus and trusting him to make that change. That's the message of faith. Lord, I'm a sinner. I can't do anything. But we got the good news that Jesus can. Ask him to save you. Isn't that a blessing? He has saved, has he saved you? Are you happy about that? He wants to save other people and help them. So what are we going to preach? We're going to, we're going to, we're going to say, we're going to, we're going to tell them about a, a powerful message. We're going to tell them about a pointed message. We're going to tell them about a personal message. There's three things that God wants us to do when we're out witnessing and, or just out and about and sharing with people. What's this personal message? 
See, Christ encouraged his disciples to be witnesses. We see that in Acts 1.8. I think we already read it. It says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses. What's a witness? A witness is someone who gives a firsthand account of something that they've seen or experienced. I'm telling people what Christ did for me, how he changed my mind, how he changed my life, how miserable I was and how happy now I am. Well, you're not happy if you're living in rebellion to God, so why don't you just get those things straightened out and start living for him and you'll be happy again. People have real problems out there, don't they? And they need someone who will empathetically share with them. Give them some tangible solutions. You know, a lot of people out there have religion, but religion's dead. They don't need religion, they need a relationship with God. And if you've got one, tell people about it. Remember a young man that I had, I was, uh, had out witnessing with me one time, and we came across some guy who went to you know, a church that didn't really teach salvation, and the guy who was with me, he had just gotten saved out of that church kind of uh, denomination. So I said, hey, Peter, just give him your testimony. And he starts giving his testimony, but it didn't go the direction I was thinking. He starts telling him, yeah, he says, I've never, he says, I know God now. I come to this church, and I know how to pray. I know how, what he was, and I'm thinking, no, tell him how you got saved. Peter was just all excited that he knows God. He did get saved. He just was telling him how he knew God and how, he, before he used to pray and nothing happened. Now he prays and he actually talks to God, and he was giving his testimony. It was real to Peter. And he was making it real to that other person that he was witnessing to. Tell them what you used to believe. Tell them what God's taught you. Tell them the changes that God's made in your life. See, as we give the gospel, we can weave our personal testimony in with it. And that's more powerful than you just trying to give a little lesson to somebody. See, while we were in Salt Lake City a few years ago, my wife and I visited the Temple Square. And we took a tour of the LDS you know, the Mormon Church History Museum. And we were escorted through there by two young ladies, two of these uh, Mormons, and along the way, I'm just asking questions, just trying, to, just trying to get them thinking. And I shared my testimony, and I said, so if I've, you know, I said, well, you know, I haven't heard what you're telling me, but I said, but you know, I've, you know, I've, I heard in the Bible that if I was a sinner, I repented and I asked Christ to come into my life and change me, he would. I did that, and all of a sudden, my life's different and changed. I said, so do you think that's good enough for me to go to heaven? She couldn't answer. She got all dumbfounded because I gave a testimony of what God did. She didn't have a testimony because God didn't do anything in her heart and life. And got to really get in and give the gospel. It was, it was a blessing until uh, they sent reinforcements in to uh, rescue them. <laughs> they, had, they had some video cameras or something. It's like, oh, let's go. This guy's doing too much talking. Let's get them out of there. But we were able to sow the seed, and that was a blessing. So what are we going to do? We're going to present a powerful message, a pointed message, tactfully, and then a, a, a personal message. Where? Well, the Bible says go into where? All the world. That's where. He said, you know, Jesus was given a, a parable of the, la, of the Great Supper and illustrated, uh, which illustrated getting the gospel out. And the parable is this, and the Lord said unto, his, unto the servants, <clears throat> go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Where should we go? The highways, those busy places of concourse, the hedges out in the bush, in Africa, or the Amazon, somewhere people don't know. God wants us to get out there and give the gospel. The highways and the hedges. Paul's testimony was this. He said, I have showed you and have taught publicly and from house to house. He taught in the market. He taught in the schools. He taught in prison. He taught in houses. He was looking for opportunities wherever he went, and so should we. Let's get to the next one, number four. Who? Who? Well, who should preach? All of us. We already covered that. But who should we preach to? The Bible says in Mark 16, 15, every creature. 
which unsaved person shouldn't hear the gospel? Are we going to start de determining which countries will and which countries won't? Are there not nations that need to hear the gospel? I could take you to village after village in Africa where they're crying for someone to come and bring the gospel. They want to hear. <laughs> I remember just being out in, on a dirt road and, you know, from like a three-hour bike ride down the road, I'm just out passing out gospel tracks. A guy stops on his bicycle, takes the track. He said, ah, pastor, we need churches in our village too. Can you come? I mean, nowhere's village. I mean, three hours out there on a bike. You know how many villages there were out there? I'm only one person. We need more people who have the heart that the Lord had to want to reach all the world and, and give the gospel to every creature. But as we heard this morning, we're not going to have missionaries until we deal with our sin and see the Lord as holy, holy, holy and see ourselves as wicked sinners that need to be right with Him. Who? Everybody should hear. The rich and the poor. The educated and the uneducated. The powerful and the powerless. The haughty and the humble. The likely candidate to get saved and the unlikely candidate to get saved. My dad was getting gas one day and he pulled up to the gas pump, and the guy up in front of him was pumping gas, and he noticed this was a, quite a wealthy man. Big fancy car, slick suit, I mean, big gold chain. My dad's thinking, this guy's a high roller. And uh, then that guy makes contact with my dad and just starts cussing. Not at my dad, but he was, he'd been going through something. He, had, he, he got burned by some doctor somehow just upset like you wouldn't believe how he almost died because of this doctor, and he's just going on and on and on. And my dad's thinking, Lord, why me? <laughs> I don't want to listen to this. I mean, who wants to listen to some guy cussing and complaining all the time, right? Eventually, my dad said, hey, let's just pull over there, and, and um, I'll, I'll hear you out. He didn't want to hear the man's vile language, but he sensed something was wrong. And they got over there, they pulled over, and they parked, and after the man unloaded, my dad unloaded <laughs> the gospel. And he asked him, hey, when that doctor messed up and you had died, if you had died, where would you have gone? The guy said, I don't know. Would you like to know? Yeah. So he took some time and opened the Bible that he had in his car, went through the gospel with him. By the end, that man bowed his head, received Christ, had a visibly changed attitude <laughs> and vocabulary. <laughs> and he thanked my dad repeatedly. Was he a likely candidate to get saved? My dad thought not. I would have thought the same thing. It's like, just get out of here. But no, he had a need. Even some of the most incorrigible people, people need to hear the gospel. And you know, some of them even get saved. So how shall we say something? Quickly, you may wonder, well, how can I witness? We can witness confidently. You can write these verses down, Acts 4, 31, right? They, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Of Paul, it was said in Acts chapter 28, verse 31, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence. All confidence. What a powerful message life-changing message we have, we can be confident with giving it. It works. We've seen it work. Let's just keep working it. Witness with confidence. How else? Witness competently. You know, you might not know everything about the Bible, and guess what? Nobody does. I've been studying it for years. I'm still learning, and I'm going to continue to learn. And there'll be people out there who are going to try to stump you. Don't get worried about them trying to stump you. Just get right back on the gospel and keep on going. And what you don't know, you can learn, right? There's one, one guy in our church, and we talk often, and uh, he's been going out and doing more and more witnessing, more and more soul winning. He doesn't know all the answers. He comes sometimes, and we discuss some matters. 
He'll go back and study a little bit more. You know what that, that's doing? It's making him better equipped the next time those questions come up. He's getting more and more confidence. He's becoming more and more confident. And God is using him. And people get saved. Why? Because he wants to use the word of God skillfully. Sometimes we're not very skillful with it. And that's because we haven't grown and matured like we should. And we need to take those steps. Get out there and get some OJT, right? On the job training. You get out there, you'll learn. You'll learn. And then not only confidently, competently, but compassionately. Paul said we should be speaking the truth in love, Ephesians 4, 15. Show some compassion. People are down and out. Help them. Lend a helping hand. Show them that Christ loves them. The Bible says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Be kind, humble, and gentle. He said, that doesn't sound real manly. It sounds real Christian to me. And then, fourthly, how? Creatively. Is it creatively? Well, yeah, I'm kind of art artsy, so this will be good. No, just creatively. Just, just think. Think about how you can get, get the gospel to people. When you're handing a tract, think about an opening line. It makes it easier to give the tract out. Right? If you're giving out the Amazing Grace track, that's an easy one. Hand and say, hey, I'm sure you've heard about this song. Everyone knows the song. Here's the true story behind it. Well, there you go. And then if you have a little more time, say, yeah, the guy who wrote it, he was a really bad guy. But then God changed his life, and he wrote about the grace that changed his life. And that same grace can change our lives, too. Don't we all need a little bit of changing? Oh, yeah, you can say that again. Oh, let me say it again, then. Right? Just looking, being creative, thinking things through and how you can do it. Make a phone call. Someone you've been meaning to talk to, stop meaning and just do it. Write a letter. Right? With Brother Johnson. Write that letter. Does it work? My uncle, my mom's brother, my mom and dad had witnessed to him for uh, years, over the years to no avail. My mom died in 2019 in the summer. She had written a letter years ago when her dad died to family members going through the plan of salvation and just giving the gospel out. We included it. We got creative. We included that in the funeral program. He wasn't able to come because of health problems, but we sent him a copy of the funeral program, which also had a copy of my mom's letter having the gospel in it. We gave him the gospel. He was all tore up because he lost his sister. The Lord didn't leave me alone about my uncle, and I kept praying for him. In 2020, the fall, I wrote a letter to him, giving him a testimony, a witness, and some tracts. Last Christmas, again, I sent him a Christmas card with a gospel track and said, hey, I wrote this one Maybe you should, could, could take the time to read it. Think maybe you'd read it if I wrote it, right? On January 12th of this year, my dad had, was talking to him on the phone. They were discussing all the current events, the horrible things going on in the world. And my dad just simply said, he's, he's witnessed to him many times, he says, I believe the Lord's going to come back soon. He said, wouldn't you like to be ready when he does? Wouldn't you like to ask him to come into your life? And my uncle said, you know, you and Dave have been talking to me a lot about that lately. I said, so I did that. My dad's like, you did? He said, yeah. He said, I asked the Lord into my life. He said, well, how did you come about? He says, I finally saw my need. Keep at it. Say something. Don't be a Fifth Amendment Christian. I plead the Fifth. I've got the right to remain silent as a Christian. You don't have a Fifth Amendment right when it comes to the gospel. 
I thought about titling the message, Fifth Amendment Christians. Maybe preacher boys can do that someday, right? No, are you a Fifth Amendment Christian? I got the right to remain. No, you don't have the right to remain silent. Someone needs that gospel. When? When? That's the last question. When? Well, Jesus said in John 4, 35, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they're white already to harvest. God doesn't want us to delay. I want you to help me finish this sermon outline. When? When? If God spoke to you about something, and you're taking notes, I've got a challenge for you. Write down when you're going to do something about it. When? Today? Before the day's over? Start that letter? Make that phone call? Tomorrow? By the end of the week? Ask God who he wants you to speak to. How you'll reach out to him. And when you plan to do it. Will you make a commitment to God? Lord, I'm willing. Would you please help me? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.